After a stellar run at the box office for a few years in the mid-1980s, Police Academy found itself staring into the pop culture abyss as the new decade rolled into view. Delivering six films in six years between 1984 and 1989, the comedy film franchise have raked in close to half a billion dollars at cinemas alone. The conveyor belt of sequels and spin-offs seemed at one point to be never-ending. Sadly though, nothing in life lasts forever and, by the arrival of the rapidly changing pop culture landscape of the 1990s, the brand's future was entirely uncertain. The law of diminishing returns was in full effect for the once mighty empire and a consistent decrease in quality and earnings had meant the police academy was still delivering a lot of jokes. Uh, sorry, I meant to say it was turning Police Academy into a bit of a joke. With the sixth film in the series, 1989's City Under Siege, proving not just a miss with critics but also a failure at the box office, could Police Academy possibly hope to claw back some goodwill with its once huge fan base? How would the cast and crew fare outside of the Police Academy bubble? Would a Soviet sidebar and an attempted move into international diplomacy open up new avenues of opportunity, or be the franchise's final merciful dead end. As we move into the 21st century, could one of Hollywood's hottest directors give the brand a surprise new modern day lease of life? And what legacy has Police Academy and its frenetic journey left behind in its wake? Well, saddle up as we conclude our deep dive journey into the Police Academy universe when we venture into the 1990s and beyond in the final part of No Laughing Matter. Hi, Culture Slice here. Before we deep dive into the 1990s, if you haven't seen part one of No Laughing Matter, which charts the incredible rise of Police Academy to being one of Hollywood's most profitable series, you can watch it here. Part 2, which explores Police Academy's fall from grace across the late 1980s, is available here. And if you've enjoyed the series and want to see more from Culture Slice, you can also subscribe to stay up to date with the latest videos. Anyway, that's enough of that, on with the final part of the Police Academy journey. At the dawn of the 1990s, after the financial failure of Part 6 and more than half a decade of fairly constant Police Academy workload, the major players of the franchise had quietly gone their separate ways. With no more films on the slate and offshoots like the cartoon and comic having ceased production, it was time to experience life beyond the brand's bubble. Paul Maslansky, the producer and driving force behind Police Academy, the man whose quick thinking and two-page treatment had single-handedly kick-started the entire thing at the beginning of the 1980s, attempted to make lightning strike twice in a new decade by ripping off his own idea. Ski Patrol, a new comedy film which had gone into production just as City Under Siege was arriving in cinemas in 1989, was the producer's big hope for the 1990s. Employing much of the same Police Academy formula, the story featured a ragtag bunch of misfits who make up the Ski Patrol, having to follow the evil plans of a land developer. It was essentially Police Academy on ice. Or, you know, snow. Ski Patrol! Proudly proclaiming from the creator of Police Academy on the posters and in trailers, Ski Patrol arrived in cinemas in January 1990 and sank without much of a trace. Is it a good film? Not really. Would I recommend you chuck it on if you have a spare 91 minutes sometime? Absolutely. It won't win any awards on any metric, but as a ridiculous time capsule comedy of a long gone era, it's kind of fun. Ski Patrol only managed $8 million at the domestic box office across its entire run though, less than each of the first four Police Academy films had achieved in their first week on release and the potential for a 1990s franchise was wiped away almost instantly. This is already over. Maslansky's other early 90s attempt at riding the coattails of former Police Academy glories was a much delayed film called Honeymoon Academy, which starred Police Academy 1 alumni Kim Cattrall. 
originally shot back in 1988 under the name For Better or For Worse. Even with a last minute attempted cash in title change, Honeymoon Academy, which it's worth noting didn't actually feature any academies, but did feature Lance Kinsey, aka Proctor, completely bombed both critically and commercially. Arriving 18 months late in just a small smattering of cinema screens, one review noted that opening night screening in New York saw no paying customers at all. Clearly, Police Academy's powers of persuasion with the audience were at the very least slipping, if they hadn't in fact totally evaporated. Just slapping the word Academy on a film title wasn't going to work in the 1990s. The world is changing. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. At the complete other end of the spectrum to Ski Patrol and Honeymoon Academy, Maslansky broke new ground with The Russia House in late 1990, noted as the first American movie to be largely shot in the Soviet Union. The starry spy thriller, which featured Sean Connery and Michelle Pfeiffer in lead roles and strangely didn't include any references to Police Academy on the poster, received good reviews but barely made its production budget back across its cinema run. Despite this, Maslansky had proved that an American film could be made successfully in the increasingly hospitable Russian setting, an idea he would bank for later in the decade. He did also have another hit with Cop and a Half, starring Burt Reynolds in 1993, though not close to the scale of Police Academy, and the only sequel it ever produced came with a Lou Diamond Phillips TV movie in 2017, long after Maslansky's involvement had ended. No sequel for you. The cast of Police Academy continued working at the start of the new decade, but didn't pull up too many trees either. Police Academy remained their main calling card in the years after the series had been put into storage by Warner Brothers. Leslie Easterbrook made cameos on the likes of Baywatch and Hangin' with Mr. Cooper. G.W. Bailey worked consistently across TV and low-budget movies, including an awesomely 90s Dennis Hopper action film called Double Crossed. David Graff turned up in Quantum Leap and Seinfeld. Michael Winslow lent his voice to the New Kids on the Block cartoon series. They were bit part players beyond the Academy walls. Bobcat Goldthwait, who had left off to Police Academy 4, had landed a role in the stone cold Christmas classic Scrooged after departing the franchise. He also starred in Hot to Trot in the late 80s, a truly wild comedy featuring a talking horse voiced by John Candy, a film which was savaged by critics and failed to make its production budget back in cinemas. Even Steve Gutenberg, who had left the franchise behind and become a bigger star than Police Academy had ever made him, with the enormous success of Three Men and a Baby in 1987, barely made any on-screen appearances for a few years once the sequel, Three Men and a Little Lady, had landed in 1990. In his own words, the Goot took something of a self-imposed exile. I left home at 17, so I missed a great deal of my own growing up. I missed so many things with my family. I'd become everything I ever wanted to be, but I wanted to just be a little closer to my family and I decided I'd like to work when I want to work. Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers. The studio which had benefited from the unexpected payday bonanza of Police Academy and then contributed to running the brand into the ground was also prioritizing different comedies in the new decade. Their 1990 comedy offering included the likes of Joe vs. the Volcano and Roald Dahl's The Witches. Quite a vibe shift from the 80s chaos. Clearly, they were still finding their feet in the new age. These two films combined grossed less than half of the first Police Academy cinema takings alone. Bonfire of the Vanities, which arrived in 1990 and attempted to satirize New York high society, became one of the most infamous disasters in Hollywood history. Variety's review noted that, the caricatures are so crude and the revelations so unenlightening of the human condition that the satire is about as socially incisive as an entry in the Police Academy series. By 1990, that was a damning indictment. My uh, not so spotless reputation precedes me. Anyway, at the start of the 90s, the times, they were a changing. In Hollywood, however, a once profitable intellectual property is never really gone. After a few years of laying dormant, Warner Brothers were ready to attempt to flog Police Academy once again for whatever it was still worth. By 1993, Police Academy 7, Mission to Moscow, had been greenlit by the studio for an August 1994 release date. 
and it was all thanks to the changing geopolitical situations in Eastern Europe. Obviously. Even though Police Academy 7 had been given a go-ahead for a 1994 release, it wasn't exactly at the top of Warner Brothers' priority list for the year. As production began in the autumn of 1993, Paul Maslansky wasn't even clear whether the film would be getting a cinema release at all. His hope was that the movie they delivered would impress execs so much that they would have no choice but to give Police Academy 7 a major push. Um, yeah. After all, there's always hope. The world a seventh Police Academy film would be entering was vastly different from the one the franchise had initially succeeded in a decade earlier. In terms of popular culture, the change would be most acutely felt in music. As soon as Nirvana's Smells Like Teen Spirit exploded onto the rock scene in late 1991, it set off a chain of events which instantly switched the musical zeitgeist from 80s hair metal and glam rock to the alternative sound and aesthetic. Combined with the rise of gangster rap, perceived authenticity in music was now front and center. The 1980s, the age of Police Academy, was well and truly in the rearview mirror now. Kurt Cobain's death in April 1994, at the peak of his artistic powers, was a seismic moment of the era. Bringing the story full circle back to Police Academy, the support act from Nirvana's final North American tour in the autumn of 1993 was strangely enough Bobcat Goldthwaite's stand-up comedy. Kurt Cobain and the one-time Zed soon became friends, and Goldthwaite even starred in a 1993 Nirvana video. Though Hollywood didn't quite have a singular Nirvana moment, that search for authenticity from audiences did deliver something of a shift in cinema output as well. People want something more real, more grounded. The bombastic, overblown concept films of the 1980s slowly began to subside. There was a prevailing sense, whether right or not, that the 1980s excesses, both on screen and off, had gone too far, and that a sense of perspective was very much needed. As much of the Western world was gripped by a painful economic recession in the early 1990s, the party was over and a large part of the popular culture the world was consuming more acutely reflected people's hopes and fears. Comedy had also moved on from the days of the mid-80s, when Police Academy first made its way into the world. The big hitters in the genre were now postmodern and full of pop culture references like Wayne's World, high concept and technically advanced like The Mask, or family-friendly escapism, like Mrs. Doubtfire. In many ways, Police Academy felt like it was decades detached from these films, a quaint and archaic artifact from a completely different generation. Frat House Fair and Slapstick had been very much pushed to the margins, or perhaps more accurately, the video store. The world had also seen drastic political and social upheaval. Although in the modern age it might seem unthinkable that a throwaway Hollywood cop comedy could decamp production to Russia, in the early 90s there was a sense of logic to it all. The fall of the Berlin Wall in late 1989 marked the beginning of the end of both the Soviet Union and the Cold War, with the latter officially ending two years later. In the meantime, images of the opening of the first McDonald's in Moscow had been beamed around the world in 1990, symbolizing a new Russian embrace of American culture. The concept of a police academy film being made in the country had originally been floated in the planning for the sixth film in the late 1980s, but wasn't considered feasible at the time. With the changing political map of the world, and Maslansky having already made the Russia house there recently, by 93, he had the green light. Police Academy, Mission to Moscow, to kick many, many buskies. Police Academy, Mission to Moscow, ended up being written by Randolph Davis and Michelle S. Chodos. Davis had only one film credit to his name, a straight-to-video submarine comedy called Going Under, and Chodos had never written a film before. It was directed by Alan Meter, who had made the Rodney Dangerfield vehicle Back to School, the Richard Pryor comedy Moving, and the Cindy Lauper-inspired Girls Just Wanna Have Fun in the 1980s, but hadn't made a film in years by this point. 
once again, you had to wonder whether this was the strongest creative team available. But we were where we were by this stage. Police Academy wasn't exactly the hottest opportunity in town by 1993. In terms of on-screen talent, Police Academy 7 managed to bring back a few of the original cast members for the trip to Moscow, a list which thankfully included both Harris and Lassard. Well, that's a relief. Bubba Smith, whose character Hightower had been one of the constants for the first six films, was offered the chance to return once again, but he refused, in solidarity with his friend Marion Ramsey, who played Hooks, who, whether for creative or financial reasons, had not been contacted about reprising her role. Amazingly enough, when you look back at it now, the list of new cast members was probably the most impressive of the entire series, as it featured not only Claire Forlani and Ron Perlman, but Sir Christopher Lee, who was in the midst of his pre-Lord of the Rings Hollywood run when he would seemingly appear in almost anything. Even for Lee at this time though, he only did this as a favour to Maslansky, with the pair having worked on projects dating back to the producer's very first gig 1964's Castle of the Living Dead. The Mahoney role was played by Charlie Schlatter, who replaced the original Mahoney replacement Matt McCoy, who is nowhere to be seen here. Schlatter had starred in films like the soul-swapping 1988 comedy 18 Again, and had been the choice for the title role of the very short-lived Ferris Bueller TV show in 1986. He would later become a bigger star with his role in the Dick Van Dyke medical crime series, Diagnosis Murder. I like Diagnosis Murder and uh, Skin Flicks. He's fine here, I guess. And his romance with Forlani is dealt with quite sweetly. But as we'll soon discuss, Mission to Moscow had far bigger problems to contend with. The story revolved around Lee's Russian commandant, calling for help from Lassard and his American crew who make the trip to Moscow as part of the new era of friendship between the two superpowers. They attempt to solve a case around a video game, helpfully called The Game, which is being created by Perlman's Russian mob boss to help him take down global security systems and achieve world domination. Or something. And there we go. Moscow hijinks ensue. We're doing a sequel. Production took place between September and November 1993, mainly on location in Moscow. Barely days after shooting began, a full-blown constitutional crisis, which began with street fighting between police and protesters and escalated to the army shelling and storming government buildings to remove demonstrators and objectors, halted filming. With commentators at the time stating that Russia was on the brink of a new civil war, production somewhat amazingly ended up resuming fairly rapidly. There were other hairy moments, like Michael Winslow's wireless microphone in one scene, unwittingly using the same frequency as the Russian military, almost causing an international incident, with filming invariably delayed, cancelled or rearranged due to interference from local officials, and the fact that the country was in an actual state of emergency at the time. The cast and crew suffered through a local food shortage. Producers even had a contingency plan to move production to Budapest if things got any worse. But in the end, filming wrapped after a couple of months, everyone got out alive and the post-production could begin in the calmer environment of Burbank, California. Now Warner Brothers just needed to decide what to do with the thing. This thing better not go straight to video. Police Academy Mission to Moscow wouldn't see the light of day in the US until August of 1994 which might have felt like an age for Maslansky, having been used to churning the series out as quickly as they could less than a decade prior. Any hopes he had held for a wide cinema debut were soon dashed too. Warner Brothers had momentarily considered a full release when they had seen that reruns of older Police Academy films were still scoring good TV viewing figures. Then they actually saw Mission to Moscow and massively cut back the cinema rollout plan. It ended up in just a few screens as a token gesture. Police Academy 7 would become, for all intents and purposes, just another straight-to-video release for the company. Paul Maslansky must have contemplated just how different things could have been. He had originally wanted to bring the series back for a 1991 release date, all guns blazing under the title Police Academy 7 Operation Scotland Yard, with ideas of Steve Gutenberg and others making their return for the franchise's grand finale. Obviously, that didn't happen 
Anna's police academy mission to Moscow dripped into a small number of screens on August 26, 1994, it would have been hard not to consider what might have been. And I could have been a contender. Critical reviews, what there were for a fairly minor release, were damning in the extreme. They concluded that Police Academy 7 was an inept geriatric romp for completists only, a deeply desperate attempt to jumpstart the ailing franchise, and quite simply, the very worst of the series. Those critics who could give a zero score did, otherwise the film was awarded a low one star as standard. Even those who had been involved in the production failed to give the finished product their backing. Director Alan Mehta disowned the film before it was even released. Mehta later stated that the only film of the seven in the series he liked was the first film, including the one he had just directed. Ron Perlman would say once that he felt his work on Mission to Moscow was a public service, in that it finally meant there would be no more Police Academy films because of it. I'm not going to apologise, I did that piece of <laughs> Claire Forlani accepted the job without knowing what Police Academy even was, which is probably damning enough in itself. She would bounce back from this with her next film, Kevin Smith's second movie, More Rats, and go on to star with Brad Pitt in Meet Joe Black, but the Police Academy film series wouldn't show comparable powers of recovery. Unsurprising given the awful reviews, the way past its prime style and name value, and the almost non-existent release strategy, Police Academy Mission to Moscow was a total financial bomb. On a production budget of $10 million, the film made just over $126,000 at North American cinemas. It's true we're losing money. It was, of course, the least successful film in the franchise's history. For a series whose first five films had hit number one at the box office, and whose first three had raked in over $100 million each worldwide, this was pretty much as low as it could have gone. Police Academy was well and truly on the movie scrap heap. I can't sugarcoat this one. Mission to Moscow is truly terrible stuff. Whether the difficult filming circumstances had an impact, or if it was a case of too little too late, aiming to reboot a long finished franchise without the requisite creative nows to do so, this Police Academy film is one which, for me, is every bit as bad as the reviews would have you believe. Hollywood gets a lot of criticism, a lot of it valid, but being a Warner's exec faced with this movie in 1994, you can understand why they decided to bury it. The script is clearly a massive issue. Randolph Davis and Michelle S. Chodos would never write a film or TV show again. Mission to Moscow essentially ended their Hollywood careers stone dead, and watching this film makes that outcome unsurprising. The slapstick is jarring, uncomfortable even, in a way it hasn't been previously, and the whole film is strangely flat throughout. Beyond the words on the page though, the delivery is almost entirely lifeless, and the performances are routinely phoned in. I'm a huge George Gaines fan, but even the combined acting prowess of him and Christopher Lee cannot shock this film into life. I am completely disgusted with you all. The subplot involving Lassard mistakenly heading off to stay with a random Russian family had some potential, but ends up producing some of the worst scenes of the entire series. If my mind journeys back to my feelings about Police Academy 7 when I first saw it, I remember 11 year old me thinking it was a disaster even back then, and I was sadly right. Even if I've dismissed elements of the earlier franchise, Mission to Moscow is head and shoulders below the rest. Looking at the top performing films of the week of its US cinema release crystallises just how much Mission to Moscow was a film out of time in 1994. The same week it was quietly dumping Police Academy 7, Warner Bros was also releasing North America's number one movie, Natural Born Killers, a film which could not have been a starker contrast to the later films in the comedy franchise. The Mask, the only comedy in the top five of the week, equally made Police Academy 7 look like a museum piece, and would eventually go on to make over $350 million at the worldwide box office. Warner Brothers did actually release a smash hit cop comedy in 1994, one which featured a zany group of characters, co-starred a legendary former NFL football player, and grossed over $100 million in cinemas before going on to sell in excess of 4 million VHS copies in the first three weeks of release. I applaud you. Woo! Woo! Sadly, for our story at least, 
This wasn't a long lost police academy instalment. The NFL football legend was Dan Marino, and the film in question was in fact Jim Carrey's first success of the year, Ace Ventura Pet Detective, a movie which just slightly outdid Mission to Moscow in terms of revenue and cultural impact. This wasn't 1984 anymore, and the Police Academy brand was well and truly damaged goods now, whatever it had achieved once upon a time. <laughs> Amazingly enough, Mission to Moscow wasn't quite the final nail in the 90s coffin of this seemingly unfinishable franchise. A few years after the seventh film, a writer and producer called Gerald Sanoff managed to build up enough goodwill within Warner International Television to get Police Academy the series off the ground. Sanoff's main claim to fame had been as the writer of 73 episodes of Matlock. Matlock! He would later be involved in adapting international versions of American programs, including the 2000 Italian take on Tequila and Bonetti. What is Tequila and Bonetti, you ask? Well, Tequila and Bonetti is, of course, a buddy comedy series featuring an Italian-American officer and a dog. Originally created during a time when talking babies and animals were at their peak in Hollywood, the program's gimmick was that we could hear Tequila the Mastiff's thoughts, and that he spoke in the kind of street jive only a 90s TV exec would think was a good idea. What up, ladies? <laughs> God, I love burritos. I'm gonna kill him. Hey, take your ticket. <laughs> anyway, moving on. With Paul Maslansky in an executive producer role, funding delivered via a network of investors from different parts of the globe and TV syndication secured across the US, Police Academy the series, not to be confused with the late 80s animated series, introduced an entirely new crew of recruits aiming to graduate from the academy. It was essentially Police Academy, the new class. Episodes were given self-aware titles like Beauty is Only Academy Deep, Bring Me the Turtle of Commandant Hellfinger, Dead Man Talking, and Two Men and a Baby, with original Police Academy writers Neil Israel and Pat Proft helping to write the thing, and Jim Drake, who made Police Academy 4, returning to direct a few episodes. Sadly, Police Academy 6 director Peter Boners didn't come back into the fold, but you can't have everything in life. Michael Winslow, who would seemingly literally do anything if it featured the words Police Academy on it, was the only permanent cast member to transfer over from the films, but a number of other familiar faces made guest appearances. It goes without saying that the series was better than Mission to Moscow. Not that this is saying too much, but as a bookend for the franchise, it could definitely have been worse. In the annals of Police Academy lore, this series is no masterpiece, but it's also no disgrace. It's better than Tequila and Bonetti at least. Clearly though, the syndicated series wasn't proving particularly profitable. The show would end its run by May of 1998, and the last attempt at saving the brand was, at least for now, finished with it. Anyway. Even if it would sustain some sort of life on video and TV, the unmitigated disaster of Mission to Moscow, combined with a temporary resurrection of the sitcom, meant that this most 1980s of brands had run out of legs as we headed directly, head first, into the 2000s. Over the next two decades, you would see or hear occasional rumblings of a Police Academy comeback being on the horizon. In the early 2000s, Paul Maslansky and original cast members stated that a new film was definitely on the cards, pending one or two minor details, but that project was shelved by 2007. In the late 2000s, Steve Gutenberg popped up to say he would not only be starring in, but also potentially writing and directing a new Police Academy movie. Both Maslansky and Gutenberg would sprinkle Easter eggs in the press about a new film being very much a goer for a while longer. But alas, nothing more concrete ever came of it. The Goot managed to reunite at least some of the remaining Police Academy cast, 
in 2015 for the frankly ridiculous sci-fi TV movie Lava Lantula. Get off the street! I'd love to help you, but I got shark problems right now. What do you mean you didn't see it? You haven't seen it? No. Though an actual 8th Police Academy film appeared no closer. As Hollywood became ever more reliant on reboots and reusing established IPs though, it was maybe unsurprising when a brand new Police Academy story looked to be a genuine goer in the mid 2010s under a fresh creative vision. The fact that it was to be delivered by Jordan Peele and his comedy partner Keegan-Michael Key, with the pair looking to intersperse a more serious narrative in with the comedy, made this a project with legitimate potential. Given the talent involved, it's hard to think of a better way to bring the Police Academy back into the modern world. Beyond just a nostalgia hit, it could be legitimately good. Warners had also undoubtedly seen the success achieved by reboots like 21 Jump Street and decided it might be nice to get a piece of that pie. Sadly for our story though, best laid plans soon went awry. First, Key and Peele's 2016 comedy film Keanu disappointed at the box office. Then, one year later, Jordan Peele became one of the hottest directors in Hollywood with the huge success of his horror breakout Get Out, which made $255 million on a $4.5 million budget and was nominated for and won Oscars. Peele was making more serious fare in a different genre from now on. Suddenly, updating a 1980s cop comedy series was perhaps understandably no longer able to be Jordan Peele's top priority. At the same time, Hollywood essentially stopped releasing comedies as major releases. Combining this with the changing perception of the police force in the real world, especially in America, meant that Police Academy's reboot window of opportunity for what could have genuinely been a glorious return had slammed shut. Having abandoned the franchise after the fourth instalment, it's maybe somewhat odd that the main voice still mentioning that it could return remains Steve Gutenberg. But here we are though he still occasionally raises hopes of another one in interviews, with every passing year it becomes less and less likely to actually happen. Do I think another Police Academy film will see the light of day? Given the last 25 years of rumour and innuendo, an eighth part of the original story does seem highly unlikely. As this is show business though, and Hollywood has invariably demonstrated that they prefer stolen old ideas to new ones, a reboot one day could happen. For now, all we have is the scattered history of the original Police Academy franchise's chaotic run. And as we come to the climax of our No Laughing Matter journey, it's time to zoom out and consider the wider legacy of this iconic, notorious 80s Hollywood brand. As the years and decades have rolled on, Police Academy has increasingly become a punchline of jokes not only on The Simpsons, but instead it's been painful and disturbing like that movie Police Academy, but also most things Seth MacFarlane was involved in. What was that? Oh, it's just Michael Winslow from Police Academy. <laughs> and even a recurring gag on the drama series This Is Us. You like Police Academy 4? Though very occasionally Police Academy has been referenced positively in culture and media, it has largely been seen as a prime example, perhaps THE prime example, of 1980s Hollywood's excessive milking of sequels to the point where most of the value had been drained away. Even if the films initially made a fairly large impact, especially after part one in 1984, the brand's perceived legacy is in tatters four decades on. Whether it was justified or not, it's had some really bad PR over the years. But the thing is, from the beginning of the 90s, Police Academy films became regular schedule fillers on TV channels across the world, a trend which has essentially never stopped. I mean, think about how many times you've seen that a Police Academy film is on the telly in your country. I know here in the UK I've actually lost count of the amount of times I've spotted one on the EPG on a weekend afternoon. I love it when you talk dirty, sir. Police Academy 3, next Sunday at 5.30 on 5. The first Police Academy film doesn't tend to get held up as a classic comedy, even of its time, when I'd argue that it could be. 
some far more exalted movies of the era have actually aged worse. When I was at school, kids would still do impressions of Michael Winslow's vocal gymnastics in the playground. By the time I had my own place, the presence of a random Police Academy film on the TV schedule became one of my favourite tweeting subject matters. Even to this very day, there is still a Police Academy stunt show running at a theme park in Madrid, Spain. It's long since closed in other countries' theme parks, but the good people of Madrid are keeping the dream alive. Coming back around. Keep the dream alive. I'm getting slightly distracted, but the point is that even if the cynic in us might dismiss Police Academy out of hand, and it's become cool to do it in films and TV shows, I think there is a larger positive sentiment amongst the wider viewing public than most give it credit for. Even despite itself, many look back fondly on the crazy Police Academy cinema experiment. I have absolutely no scientific or statistical basis for this, but I'd be happy to argue the notion with anyone. And if you take a step back and survey the entire story of Police Academy, it's fascinating that a chance encounter Paul Maslansky had whilst on set for another project turned into seven films, two TV series, toy lines, comic books, and an almost mind-blowing amount of revenue over the years and decades. It became its own industry. But for Maslansky's quick thinking, none of that would have happened. There's a lesson in there, not just for the people of Hollywood, but for any of us too. Overall though, in exploring the world of Police Academy decades on, there is really a sense of what might have been if more of the original creative team were kept together for longer. Whatever magic Police Academy might have managed to find initially was soon gone. If Hugh Wilson hadn't gone off to make that singing cowboy film Rustler's Rhapsody, if the whole filmmaking process had been given a little more time to breathe, rather than endlessly churning out films six years in a row, if the characters had been given the sustained depth and motivations which we are only very occasionally given glimpses of, if they had maintained the R-rated element for longer, it still feels like there's a missed opportunity here. Everyone might not have made as much money initially, but in the long term, who knows? As the films continued to roll off the production line, there was a sense that Police Academy was existing purely for the bank balances rather than any sort of creative passion, that this should be milked for all it was worth and then discarded. In the words of David Graff, who played Tackleberry in all seven films when he was asked in an interview about the prospect of making future instalments during the production of one of the many sequels, I'd do it strictly for the money. Money. Hollywood rarely takes the right lessons from unexpected success, but maybe just giving more brand new concepts a chance and just making more comedies for cinema release would help both positive sentiment and the bottom line. I mean, some of the Police Academy films aren't great and critics might say that none of them are good, but especially in the early days, there are some genuine highlights. Equally importantly, they were released at a time when Hollywood was offering real variety. Whether you like them or not, wouldn't you prefer a landscape in which films like the Police Academy series are getting cinema releases, rather than the current status quo? Sure, times and audience habits change, but something has been lost along the way. The pop culture ecosystem was better off when these types of films were present in the public consciousness. As it is, this is a franchise which remains a monument to the overindulgent 1980s, a relic of a time long past with some fun films, great characters and actors, along with an impressive ability to build a brand, but a very patchy history when it came to the late series final product. I'd still argue though that at least part of the journey doesn't get the credit it deserves and could do with some re-evaluation. Police Academy never got its reboot, never got its proper reunion moment and it doesn't have the legacy value which it maybe should do. It has been somewhat lost to the pop culture void perhaps forever. So far, nobody's quit, but they will. <laughs> In the end, the story of Police Academy is a bittersweet one, but it unquestionably did, even for a short time, make a lot of people a lot of money. And in Hollywood, isn't that what really matters? Thank you.
Thank you. 